Hello everyone. Welcome to the NPTEL course on remote sensing and GIS for rural development. This is week 12, lecture 4. This is kind of the last application that we will showcase before we go into the summary and discuss about how the in weeks are interlinked and what the future steps for this course could be. As I've always mentioned, this is not just a learning of remote sensing and GIS, but very specifically for rural development. And as the NPTEL reviewers requested, multiple facets of rural development were discussed. We also made sure that students who learn the concept of rural development engage with data sets that are easily available. Therefore, open source data was shared and open source GIS platform was taught. All the exercises were done using open source software. On the same note, we'll be looking at the last applications for this NPTEL course, which is creating indicators and dashboards. So as all of you know that remote sensing for rural development has many case studies in terms of how we want to use remote sensing and at what spatial and temporal scale. And we did discuss that multiple indicators are available. One such indicator that we went in depth was NDVI. And also we looked into NDWI. However, we have to understand that not all data sets are and indicators are readily readable by policymakers. So unlike the other remote sensing and GIS users, this is very different because we want to improve or serve the rural committees. And for that, we need to make sure that those decision makers and policy makers should understand these indicators. So the indicators can be very specific or applied. There can be one individual indicator like NDVI or a combination of indicators. We looked at this when we looked at the database for indicators. In addition, these indicators can be used to drive models and can be used as a dashboard. So what is a dashboard? We are using dashboards without calling it dashboards in many instances. All the mobile apps you use have a inbuilt dashboard. The dashboard will have multiple buttons. You are allowed to select and then put in an area of request or an interest, and then you see how the output is given. We have looked at the water quality indicator, and we mentioned that the model was developed using linear regressions. And then calibrate and valid. That's it. We just gave it as an equation. So, how can an equation be helpful for a policymaker? They are not going to run these things, right? They need it as a visualization, as a result that pops out. And that is what a dashboard does. So, in the dashboard, on the behind scenes, the algorithm will be there, the linear regression will be there. All the um, person has to do is just click on what area of interest and then boom, the dashboard comes with results. So this is similar to the Google Earth Engine Sentinel Hub that we were using, wherein instead of downloading the data and doing the data for indicators, all of them are already there 
on a dashboard. You just click some buttons and then the results are populated. While this has been a very extensive task in the past, now it's almost very easy to run these uh, dashboards on open source systems. In the previous times, you need to have a database, a server to, to hold the data for your dashboard. Uh, and now you can just rent it out. You can just buy a portal uh, uh, and then you can put it for some time during your project, very, very cheap, uh, low cost. Uh, or you can also use open source systems like Google Earth Engine, OSM Mapper trackers, where you could just put your data there for, for a long time. And then there's a dashboard that can be used for it. So let's look at uh, the other benefits. Data may be easily fetched by optimizing the results. So instead of looking at the generic data set, you can optimize uh, the results by uh, using different data sets and your own data set in some, some instances, um, and then put it into the mapping. Dashboards are easier for decision making, and that is why they could call as a decision support system, DSS, or a decision support tool, DSTs. Um, and these are very important because, um, as I said, the policymakers may not be learning all these techniques and what remote sensing is, but definitely they'll know what on the ground it means. So by clicking different buttons and, and figures, you will be able to get that support through the dashboard. Let's take a look at some examples, especially the ones from my team, uh, because I do know, as I said, the constraints and why it evolved, and we will discuss. One important indicator that we developed is the remote sensing based ecological index. Uh, it was based on the framework um, of system dynamics concept of pressure state response framework. Uh, we'll show you what it means. So when you have a pressure, uh, and this was done to evaluate or support the IWMP Mandrega projects. So in the Mandrega, uh, there is a scheme where you uh, the farmers are kept without migration for 100 days uh, by some nominal um, wage. Okay, so minimum wage is given so that the farmers don't migrate to urban centers. Uh, so slowly what has happened is that time uh, of the farmer has been used for IWMP programs. What is IWMP? Integrated Water Management Programs and Plans. Um, so these plans and programs are uh, now being used uh, for increasing water storage, soil moisture, etc. But what is the benefit? So that is the pressure and the state. You see the arrow mark going, the black arrow mark. The state is the ecological status. We wanted to see how that impacts the ecological status. Uh, this was a work done by um, one of my students, Shivanand, uh, through his master's project. Um, and you could see that how the system dynamics approach was used um, and uh, different key indicators and players are going to come out. So the response is, yes, the pressure is the Mandrega projects. And then it is it has some impact. We don't know what, but it has some impact on ecological status. Normally, it's a positive impact because we are uh, letting people work for the nature rather than against the nature. So the response could be change in production, crop area, soil moisture, et cetera, et cetera. And then that can also come back as a pressure on the system. A pressure is positive and negative also. Uh, and we wanted to see how that keeps the cycle going on and on and on. So this framework um, was used for Amantrega IWMP projects. Uh, to showcase uh, better, healthier vegetation, increase soil moisture and crop production through the better use of Mandrega. So if this is correct, then all the states um, can adopt Mandrega for better management practices rather than just paying them and not following up on their time. So this can actually create ownership for the program and also make them work for the nature. So this creates an improved land surface ecology. Uh, ecology is the uh, uh, living organisms and at the land surface, um, and mostly it constitutes the soil uh, living organisms and also the plants. Ecological changes um, can be um, 
looked at as alters uh, characteristics of land surfaces because if the ecological is good, uh, activity is good, it can impact positively the land surface as per Willis. Uh, and then these are theories, so we can use uh, pretty old ones. Uh, and then we have the ecological indicators of uh, these characteristics include moisture, greenness, and dryness by zoo. Uh, so these indicators um, uh, are moisture, greenness, and dryness. But how you establish these indicators is also key for which we will be using remote sensing data. Mapped using aggregated remote sensing index. Uh, as I said, we will be using these index uh, in the following um, part. So let's discuss how the RSEI model was developed. So RSEI stands for Remote Sensing Based Ecological Index. So remote sensing is the key and the ecological index is done for a rural setting. So that's where the rural part comes back uh, into picture. Um, yeah. So what happens is RSEA aggregates 15 remote sensing ind indices. So um, the first the literature review was done to analyze how many um, very sensitive um, parts are there for this model. And it was found out that uh, there are at most 15 remote sensing ind indices uh, and that the RSI is a function of moisture, greenness, and dryness, and heat. So this was as uh, found by the previous paper. So while this is a function, how do you account for moisture? So moisture, we knew that in the previous exercise, we did NDWI. So same way we could do NDWI for the moisture. For the greenness, we can have the NDVI and dryness and heat could be coming from climate uh, indicators. So on that note, um, there could be 15 remote sensing in indices representing ecological indicators of land um, surface. Uh, so all of this can be put as a function to create the RSEI. Um, and then again, the greenness, moisture, dryness, heat. Uh, to assess changes in characteristics of the land. Uh, so this is very important. And uh, there are multiple, multiple uh, indicators. So based on these functions of themes, moisture, greenness, dryness, uh, we have uh, multiple indicators. And these are the 15 indicators that were selected from literature review as IWSI, MPS, MSPSI, NDWI, MABI. So this NDWI we have already done. Then we have NDVI, EVI, the Vegetation Index, uh, OSAVI, uh, MTVI, FVCI, TCRI, VCI. And then we have the dryness plus heat together as one theme uh, because both of them could be functions of temperature such as NDDI, NMDI, uh, NPDI, and dry eye. But the issue here is what we did um, extra modeling uh, effort is all indicators may not have equal weightages. So if you see this equation here, if you see this equation here, you have a function and the function says it's a moisture, a function of moisture, greenness and dryness and heat. However, we do know that moisture and greenness and dryness heat may not have the same impact on RSEI. So there should be some variable in front, a parameter, um, a, a normalizing function coefficient, we will say, in front of moisture to show that it is weight more or less, depending on the area and the issue. So on this note, we were looking at multiple, multiple schemes and looking at multiple um, indicators. Then using the PACA approach, which is the principal component analysis. Uh, so to be honest, you can start with more indicators. You don't need 15, you can have 30, 25, et cetera. You can just put a number and then uh, for your particular area of interest, you can run what is the most valuable sensitive indicator. And that indicator will be having a higher weightage. So for example, my moisture, all my moisture indicators are having high weightage except uh, 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 SIWSI. So then you can put SIWSI as weighted 0.1, where the others are 1, 1, 1. So you see how the value of SIWSI will go down if you put it in the same function. So that is what uh, putting weightages um, will do uh, for your data set. And then what will happen is we will be looking at uh, the um, 
database of how many water conservation activities uh, were going on, drought proofing activities, uh, and the renovation of water bodies. These are all the um, MG uh, Narega work uh, under IWMP. So there are a lot of work going on, but we don't know how it is impactful. So there is a, a dashboard that we created um, under the Rudra lab where uh, we could see that these are multiple indicators that can be helpful for looking at um, the impact uh, on the work done through Mandrega uh, and then IWMP. So this has been published as a page paper as index-based impact monitoring of water infrastructures in climate change mitigation projects, uh, a case study of Mandrega IWMP projects in Maharashtra. So we have selected Maharashtra because while the student was working in Maharashtra, uh, we were able to get a lot of data that is very important for this project. So just not getting data uh, from uh, remote sensing is key. We also needed to get and evaluate these um, schemes. So, so these schemes are present, but we have to make sure that they actually were done properly or if it's just a number of let's say 7286 uh, we need to be careful if that actually has some potential uh, on the ground so uh, as i said this this uh, paper was uh, published in frontiers in water and let's look at the methodology um, so the methodology says that first uh, we wanted to look at um, um, the satellite data Let's look at the uh, left side first, which is the crop production and productivity data. As I said, we wanted to see if the Mandrega projects had an impact on the crop productivity. Why? Because the crop productivity is kind of a measure of the ecological status. Only when the soil and the micronutrients, the organisms are healthy, there will be a healthy crop production. So it's kind of working backwards up uh, and um, you will see if uh, we have multiple themes for this uh, in terms of uh, finding which route is better to attain crop production. So we, we assume that Mandrega work will definitely uh, impact the uh, crop production and on that hypothesis, this methodology has been done. So we have to collect the crop production and productivity data from 2008 to 14. So for example, in my Dahod paper that I showcased, we didn't have that data for there because the farmers, as I said, are very, very uh, small scale farming. They didn't document all these uh, things. But here in Maharashtra, it's a very progressive uh, area where a lot of uh, agriculture is going on. So it is, they always have good data. And more importantly, it could be uh, the sugarcane, um, which is very, very important for uh, the state of Maharashtra and the yield that they get. So looking at this, so first they take the crop productivity data and then they do some uh, correlation analysis to find um, some relationship with the satellite data. But before that, we need to look at how do you get the satellite data? So Landsat 7 was used because that has the data range from 2007 to 2014 um, uh, time frame. And then some data pre-processing and post-processing was done. Uh, remote sensing indices uh, were then extracted out to uh, support the ecological status assessments. Uh, and the, all the 15 indicators are there. So all the 15 are driven by the Landsat data because there's multiple bands um, and the bands are enough to um, take this data out. So that is what uh, the data we would be taking at. Um, and then we had the PCA, as I said, the PCA part comes up where uh, we had uh, the uh, weightage for each determinants uh, and uh, indicators separately assessed. Uh, for example, if you can, um, in, if you can model the crop productivity by using seven indicators, not 15 indicators, why would you use 15, right? So that is one of the other reasons we wanted to use PCA so that to see that if it, if, if uh, five uh, indicators are very powerful uh, and then three are very uh, less powerful, then we can negotiate the weightages uh, and or neglect the weightages and then put zero, so which, which means it cancels out. Uh, so C0 is also weightage. 
Um, so that PCA exercise was done. Then the RSI estimation was done um, to determine land surface ecological conditions, which decides the crop productivity, which in improves uh, the crop productivity or impacts the crop productivity uh, and then goes to correlation analysis so you get the left side which is just the crop data productivity from 2008 to 2014 uh, whereas the landsat data one year before we always take for pre um, conditions so we have 2007 to 2014 remember that um, the crop productivity depends on the previous year's land so for example 2008 crop productivity is taken that should depend on 2007 status of water, uh, land, surface, um, ecological status, etc. So that is what was uh, taken. Um, and then uh, quickly all these were analyzed for correlations uh, and then comparative accuracy assessment to determine the best index representative of the ecological of land surface, um, uh, which impacts the crop production. So as I said, Mandrega, through Mandrega, there's a lot of activity done and the activity um, can impact crop production. So we took the crop production data, uh, then we established the indicators for Mandrika work, take the indicators and put weightages on the indicators, and only those with high weightages were used. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, what would happen is you have a temporal RSCI assessment of the study area uh, with say, using Sentinel-2. Why would Sentinel-2? Now we know that which bands are needed for the indicators. Uh, and now we know also that uh, it has some correlation with the crop productivity. So after 2014, it is smart to use the new data set with the same uh, wavelengths or bands. Uh, so the number of the band would, uh, would differ because Sentinel-2A has high spatial resolution and temporal resolution. Uh, Landsat was at 30 meters, uh, 16 days, whereas Sentinel is at 10 meters, six days. So we have better spatial temporal resolutions. Uh, and also it has multiple bands, um, which are sometimes higher than Landsat, depends on what you measure. So in that case, uh, it is better to use the same algorithm for a particular study site and then use the updated satellite source. But as the impact uh, Sentinel 2A was used, by create, created uh, the assets that are created during the Mandrega IWMP, um, etc. So the assets were already showcased in this uh, part. So on the top, we have the water conservation assets, drought proofing assets, and then rejuvenation of water bodies is kind of your tanks uh, and then um, nalas, canals, etc. This gives you all the um, uh, indicators uh, like a database uh, we always have, and then some papers that have used it or devised these uh, Indicators are on the right side. So what this index is used, you can definitely look into it. And the RSCI was done for the entire state um, of Maharashtra. So before that, the number you see uh, under the district is the number of IWMP schemes or projects uh, that were completed from 2007 to 2020. And then now the it's compared to RSCI. So if the RSCI is, is higher, um, um, you could see that uh, highlighting up right green and controlled on brown sides and yellow markings. Uh, if you if you see the uh, RSCI is pretty high, then it is green in color because ecological status is improving, whereas brown color indicates a very low RSCI. So what you could see here is Ahmednagar and Solapur are very, very similar in geological and environmental conditions. Uh, which is very important to have. You cannot take two study areas uh, very different. It has to have some commonality or most commonality. Uh, so the rainfall, temperature, the slope, the gradient, all are same between Ahmednagar and Solapur. Uh, however, however, there has been more IWMP projects uh, in Ahmednagar. So look at it, it's almost 10 times. Uh, Solapur has 2,800 schemes, uh, projects running, whereas uh, Ahmednagar has 20,028 projects um, running, completed, etc., etc. So even while running the project or establishing the project, there is a considerable improvement in the ecological status. For example, you are building a check dam, uh, a series of check dams or a cascade dam, so you build one by one. However, uh, while you build one, the impact is still coming through the picture. 
that is what I mean. So the higher color, the green color indicates uh, a higher RSCI, whereas the brown indicates a lower RSCI. Um, uh, and you could see that that beautifully correlates to the number of schemes that are present. Uh, and that is almost similar stories for across. However, we have to make sure that the geoecological conditions are the same. Otherwise, you are comparing apples and oranges. You need to compare apples and apples. So that is what we have done here. Uh, otherwise, uh, for example, I could have compared Ahmednagar to uh, Bandara or Gondia or even Gacharoli, uh, which are in different colors, not uh, green in RSCI. Uh, why did we do this? Because we want we can we cannot have this control there because the rainfall is the same in here, whereas the rainfall is much drier maybe on this side, and that cannot be a ethical comparison it has to be same um, the area the product so when you do remote sensing please make sure that you cannot show that oh one area is getting more rainfall um, uh, uh, and then the the crops are growing well whereas the other areas are getting rain, less rainfall and, and crops growing well uh, and that could be because the soil condition is good the groundwater potential is good all those things so please make sure that both these two areas that you compare are of the same um, nature and as here it's the same nature the only thing different is the IWMP numbers um, it could be because of the budgets that were allocated the population of farmers or other externalities because uh, Mandrega money is directly linked to the number of farmers so we have established a fact that uh, this um, RSEI uh, can uh, be used as a tool for establishing the benefits of Mandrika work. And these um, dashboard that uh, Shiva Nand created uh, could always get updated easily on the um, open source mapping uh, dashboard software. So this is an open source dashboard. Uh, he doesn't have to pay for it. Uh, all you just do is um, uh, VMAP kind of thing where you, uh, on my map, you put all these values in and you keep updating and then the data set gets updated on the map. Uh, there's no payment. However, uh, there's only a particular storage you can use. It's like a Gmail where you can use a particular storage after which you have to pay. Let's go to another dashboard that another student had created through the uh, GIS and um, work. So this was uh, looking at malnutrition indicators in rural India, especially the different blocks. Uh, and what you could see that uh, if you put it as numbers and tables, it doesn't look that great. But if you put it as a image with blocks colored differently based on the the percentage, let's say here, wasting is very high as red. Um, and then uh, 10 to 15 percent is high prevalence, 5 to 10 percent is medium, and then less than 5 percent is good, which is um, green. Uh, I will not get into the uh, malnutrition indicators of wasting, stunting, um, and then um, um, uh, anemic, anemic uh, but we will just look at um, why this could happen. Uh, so here you could see malnutrition indicator as wasting and stunting. Uh, and uh, stunting could be your, uh, for your particular age, there is a growth chart, you're not growing well. Okay. Um, and then there is also, uh, you are underweight. So there is another indicator which is underweight. Uh, um, and these all have some causalities. We don't know what causalities, but when you make a map and you see these clusters coming out, then that is an indicator of some problem there. Uh, for example, there is some problem in this side, uh, and then there is some problem here on the coastal regions and in the in the southern tip of India, of Kerala, and uh, so these these indicators can be used definitely. Uh, however, as I said, dashboards can be used. Um, this was done in R uh, programming. Again, it is very simple to use. Um, you cannot make very high commercials yet with open source. Uh, why? Because you do need a big storage space. Uh, with the available storage space in your Google Drive, you can connect it to our programming, our uh, dashboards, and then you can do it. So see how beautifully um, a data set has been plotted. Um, your GIS map is there. 
but then it is static, whereas your dashboard is dynamic. You can see that there is a slider. If you move the slider, then you have uh, a difference of combination of malnutrition and stunting in the state of Andhra Pradesh and the state district uh, Adilabad, uh, and that can actually create better understanding of the data. Also, another map has been done for, so these are the three indicators I said, stunting, wage, wasting, and underweight. Um, uh, and you could see that you have another uh, map for uh, stunting. So the stunting map need not be the same for uh, the wasting. Uh, you can see stunting is more prevalent along the Ganges Basin, very, very strange. Uh, with the, such a fertile land, why there is stunting? Uh, maybe there is a particular um, scheme that the government should work on to improve the stunting issues in that part of India. To complete, I will uh, show the um, land use land cover classification done by another student. Uh, we have already discussed this, how different uh, AIML packages were used for um, classifying the land uh, into sugarcane, grapes, and other aspects. Uh, but I didn't stop him there. I asked also him to make a dashboard so that the policymaker can quickly look at it. So when you give a land use land cover map, it's just a paper map or a report or a, a, an image on your email. But it doesn't it doesn't um, help you to um, uh, fully look into some options or comparison comparisons. And maybe this is not done for uh, the Sentinel Hub for this area. So it is better always to have one for yourself. Um, and that is what uh, this, this uh, student had done to look into uh, the uh, area of one of uh, of one one um, yield predicting. So I've opened this. Uh, it's, it's as I said, it is in uh, Google uh, Earth Engine apps. Uh, you can have an account there and then see how the data works. So what you what the student has done is on this side you have the uh, year for classification which is 2016 and then the yield. So we want to see the classification and how much yield comes uh, because if you have uh, grapes uh, 10 acres and 10 acres of um, sugarcane, they need not give the same yield every year because the acreage is different. How much yield comes is different. The yield depends on the on many factors, climate change, water, um, uh, labor, correct time, labor, pesticides, fertilizers, uh, disease attacks, uh, all these are there. So that is why we did both. So for your uh, classification map, we wanted to see your uh, yield map and then the previous, uh, you know, the years, uh, the, the upcoming year, from the 2016-17 was 2017-18, we have that. So you can see that how this map readily captures it. So on the left, the 2016-17 map shows clearly that it's not growing well. The yield is still less uh, and or the uh, cropping pattern has changed. It is not the same. Okay, so you can zoom in to uh, Burgaon. I'll just give it a minute to... So this is running behind in real time. Uh, because all the data was downloaded in this Google Earth Engine or given links. For example, if you want uh, uh, this to be run on Sentinel 2A data, uh, then you just write a code uh, on the dashboard and then link it to it so that it pulls the uh, data from Sentinel and then maps it. So you, you cannot uh, go too much out. <coughs> because this data was done for uh, the Maharashtra region. So we can just focus on the um, Maharashtra region, Sangli, to look at it. So you can also change. So what is the dashboard? This is what the dashboard does. You can change the years. As I said, he went 2019-20. So um, we have that um, here. You can just choose uh, the uh, one part. Uh, I'm just going to show you. So let's say 2019-20. Um, and then 2019-20, uh, we can we can search multiple parts in the same uh, map or just one part so that uh, you can look at um, the uh, difference. So now I just put just for your sake all of them the same so that you could see that both the left and right are actually the same maps. Uh, and there's no change much. So it is pulling the data from a database. It is not made because if you just make it 
then these two will now crash uh, because if you put the same uh, date so we can put the previous year let's make sure that both are same and then the yield and the classification is done so more on this the paper has been shared uh, and we can definitely look at these models uh, more in detail and upgrade them so these papers were done uh, in cambridge a lot of um, professors were working on it uh, so i said okay this is very good and you should collect data so he went to the field collected the data on the spectral signatures and then he ran the codes for the spectral signatures which classified the land but he didn't stop there as i said i asked him to do a dashboard and now this can be showcased to multiple people uh, to see if this is uh, worthwhile the time or to make a decision so for example uh, now you can say that Oh, along the river, there has been good, um, you know, benchmarking so that it's not fully populated along the rivers. Um, uh, there is some space uh, and, and different crops are growing. The white land reflects the urbanization um, and then the crops are green and red, depending on the crop type and yield. So let's get back to our uh, presentation. Uh, where we have um, most time to complete. Uh, so with this, I would like to conclude uh, today's lecture on the uh, fourth lecture on the using of indicators and um, dashboards. Uh, now you could see that uh, initially just the bands are not enough. You should convert them to indicators. Uh, and then also that we should we saw that indicators uh, are not enough. It has to be in a dashboard so that readily you can uh, visualize what are the issues in these districts, Amdagar and Jam uh, Shad village wise, uh, and then look very specifically for precise management practices. This is similar to precision agriculture or precision ag uh, surgery. If I need to operate here, in those days, they would cut the entire thing and then go in and operate. But now precision is there. You just apply medicine here. You just apply surgery uh, if needed. Otherwise, you can just put medicine inside there in a capsule. So these kind of things are uh, coming up uh, in, in big time. Um, and uh, that is where dashboards also fall in the same place. With this, I will stop today's lecture. I will see you in the next lecture, which is the final lecture for this NPTEL course. Thank you.